A huge book like Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari can't be covered in a book summary, but let's go ahead and run over some awesome concepts from it that you can think about, mole and cogitate over while you're on your treadmill. Let's look at the three revolutions who shaped who we are. Number one, the cognitive revolution. This started 70,000 years ago when Homo sapiens began to start elaborate cultures. Then came along the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, and of course the scientific revolution 500 years ago. Now, of course, writes Harari, animals who are much like modern humans first appeared 2.5 million years ago, and these were other species of humans. Let's remind ourselves again that species are grouped together under the heading genus. For example, lions and tigers, are different species under the genus Panthera. So lions would be Panthera leo, for example, and we are Homo sapiens, or wise man. So I guess my house cat is Panthera house cat. <laughs> Humans first evolved in East Africa 2.5 million years ago from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus, which means southern ape. These guys migrated to colder and warmer climates in North Africa, Europe, and Asia. Hence, to survive, they evolved in different directions. And then we got different species of Homo, for instance, Homo neanderthalensis, meaning Neanderthals, who were huge and bulky and strong, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then we had the Homo erectus, who were super durable and were around for like 2.5 million years. And there are other species too. So the question becomes, why did some species of Homo survive and others die off? Ferrari says, it takes a tribe to raise a human. Evolution favored those who were capable of forming strong social ties. One advantage and disadvantage of having these big brains is that when we came out of the womb, as we did and, and do, we're highly suggestible. Our brains are like molten glass. That's why we can educate our children to be religious or socialist or warlike or peace loving or Buddhist. Not that things are stuck like this, but you see what I'm saying when you go on Facebook, you're like, how does that person think that way? When they read the Bible, are they seeing something that I am not? What is going on here? And so we in our big brains, why did they vote for so-and-so? And so we in our big brains jump to the top of the food chain. Usually there's a checks and balances system. Oh, there's too many caribou. Well, let's make more wolves. But there's no creature that can compete with our machine guns out there. So let's face it. This makes us, by the way, extra cruel and vicious. We just got here. And so we have technology, but an apparent lack of empathy for other creatures and people visiting slaughterhouse Tell me what you think. These skills aren't quite as developed as the iPhone in some people. 300,000 years ago, Erectus were using fire, and some scholars believed that this is what inadvertently gave us our big brains because then we could suddenly eat more kinds of food, like wheat. We didn't have to spend all this time chewing on raw food. A single hour suffices. Heck, I can eat in 15 minutes. I'm not joking. Down at the uh, food buffet bar at the good food store down the street, our intestines literally became shorter, and our brains became bigger. So what happened to these other species? Did we interbreed with them or did we replace them? According to the interbreed theory, if we're having sex with other species of human, which means other animals, can you imagine? Then that means we humans are not purebreds. We're mixtures of sapiens and Neanderthals. So some people don't like to hear this. Um, <laughs> how does that affect our soul? What does this mean? You do the math. Again, Arnold Schwarzenegger, does he look like us? On the other hand, we have the replacement theory, and this means sapiens were so far advanced that there was this huge gulf. I'm not more advanced than anybody, I want to say. Um, I would totally make love to Daryl Hannah and Clan of the Cave Bear. So this speculation, however, ended in 2010 when geneticists discovered that 1-4% to of the unique populations in the Middle East and Europe is Neanderthal DNA. And these other creatures too, we're not purebreds. We come from this whole family. Biology is not black and white. Here's a great passage from Sapiens where Harari writes, what kind of cultures, societies, and political structures would have emerged in a world where several different human species coexisted? How, for example, would religious faiths have unfolded? Would the book of Genesis have declared that Neanderthals descend from Adam and Eve? Would Jesus have died for the sins of the Denisovans? Would Neanderthals have been able to serve in the Roman legions? Uh, would the Declaration of Independence say that all species of the genus Homo are created equal? Would Karl Marx have urged workers of all the species to unite? Right. Weird, right? Our lack of brothers and sisters makes us feel like we're alone on this planet. 
On the other hand, we don't seem to be a big fan of differences, do we? Look at how our cultures treat people of different colors, of different sexual orientations, for example. We can postulate that this is why our ancestors wiped out the Neanderthals. They were too familiar to ignore, but too different to tolerate. Guess what, guys? That's just chapter one. See what I mean? Maybe we'll do more. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, and feel free to share this video with any of your friends. This book, Sapiens, is a must-read. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and thumbs up button if you haven't already, and please tell me down in the comments below, would you have sex with another species? Today we're looking at Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari and we're checking out chapter two. And in it, it's saying that we can literally override the programming of our actual DNA with stories. This power to use fictive stories or imagine realities. Isn't that fascinating that our prefrontal cortex, something became, uh, there was a mutation. Something happened inside of our brains uh, that had to do with our DNA, which was the advent of the cognitive revolution, as you know. Up until this point, we were being pushed around, pushed around by our super smart and big Neanderthal brothers and sisters. But unfortunately, I don't care how big they are. They just like us were and are animals. We're animals. With this said, their cognitive abilities were far more limited because they didn't have this ability like we do. Oh, I can do this, this, and this to, to imagine with our mind to create fiction. And it's this fiction which allowed sapiens to, well, in, the, in theory, in theory, to destroy all of the other human species off the face of the earth. Again, 70,000 years ago, this is when we first began to see, you know, boats, oil lamps, bows, and arrows. What caused it? The most common theory is a DNA mutation. Like I said, a tree of knowledge mutation. And it's this fictive language that was acquired by us, the Homo sapiens, which is a heck of a lot different than what we're seeing in the animal kingdom. A monkey can yell, look, there's a lion. Or how, how do monkeys yell? And his buddies will get it, but they can't quite say, uh, look, there's a lion down by the end of the Quail River, but don't worry, it's only three feet tall. You got to go over the hornet's nest. He's still missing his claws. So don't worry, okay? It's a lion, but it's like, you know. But don't get me wrong, Neanderthals and archaic Homo sapiens also had a hard time going into detail. Of course they did, uh, which is so important for bonding. I mean, don't you and I, when we get together, we bond about gossip and rumors. Um, when, when we're over by the um, coffee pot or the water cooler, that's what we're really talking about. We're not really talking about budgeting what's happening in the literature department all the time. When we're alone, no, we're bonding. Who's sleeping with who? Oh, that, that's terrible that they would do that. that. That's slut. But the new linguistic skills the Sapiens acquired allowed this. They did. And thus we form tighter bonds with secrets. I guess the secrets create trust. So. The gossip theory and look there's a lion theory, as cool as they are, they can only go so far. Both of these theories pale in comparison to our ability to create this imaginary fictive language. That is, that is to talk about these things that we've never seen, touched or smelled. Of course, laws, legends, myths, gods, money, and to do so collectively. This allowed us to be able to work together in larger numbers, to be able to imagine things together, to construct things in our mind together. Our chimpanzee cousins live in small groups of several dozen members, and you and I, without our ability to create collective fictions inside of our minds, we would only be able to work together in a group of about 150 people. Because at that point, it just would fall apart. Um, that's a lot of interactions though, don't get me wrong, 150 people, that, that's a lot. And so that's what these earlier humans were doing, if you can call them that. Oh, of course, let's call them that. But for an example, in a band of 50 individuals, if you took 50 of us without this DNA mutation to create fictions inside of our mind, there are about 1,225 one-on-one -on -one relationships and countless more complex relationships of, of social combinations. But the mind can only handle so much. 
This is because in these small bands, these are usually led by an alpha male who has to actually spend lots of time backslapping and kissing baby chimps, just like in human politics. You know, you, you see that politician down at the conference center literally shaking hands and kissing babies. How many of your Facebook friends are actual real friends? I, I bet it's around the 150 mark, if that even. So how did Homo sapiens cross this critical threshold? That's what I'm asking myself as I'm reading this. Eventually creating vast super megaopolises. How did we do it? I mean, you can put millions of people all together in a city and it runs great, but what would happen if we put millions of chimpanzees in a city or millions of even, gosh, you know, these other earlier humans? These large groups of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in these myths. Two Catholics can help fund a hospital together because they both believe that God was incarnated in human flesh. Two lawyers will combine efforts to defend a complete stranger because they both believe in the existence of laws and justice and human rights. But none of these things actually exists outside the stories that people invent and tell one another. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no states, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of humans that allows us to sculpt the, our realities. Some sorcerers are charlatans, but most are believing in what they do, and they believe in the existence of gods and demons, just like most millionaires believe in corporations and money and LLCs, and most human activists, human rights activists, believe in the rights of human beings like it's a real thing, don't they? So to come back to where we started, while the behavior patterns of archaic humans remain fixed for tens of thousands of years, sapiens could transform their social structures the nature of their interpersonal relationships, and a host of other behaviors within a decade or two, all by telling fictive stories and by creating those imagined constructs and believing in them. You've got to understand the Homo erectus to reiterate were around for two million years and they were still using stone tools, but something happened in our brain 70,000 years ago that allowed us to tell these fictive stories. In other words, biology sets the basic parameters for the behavior capacities for Homo sapiens. It's a biological arena. However, this arena is large and allows the sapiens to invent fiction, which is basically complex games, and each generation is building upon itself. And these stories have allowed us to cooperate effectively in large numbers to create Facebook and Apple and to do impossible things. Thank you so much for joining me today and feel free to share this video with any of your friends. And maybe we'll continue on Sapiens. I want to explore evil. There's a great chapter on dualism. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and thumbs up button if you haven't already. Meanwhile, I hope you're having a fantastic week. I'll see you next Friday. It was great, as always. Woohoo, here we are again. Today we're looking at Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, particularly chapter 12, which is a riveting chapter. And he's talking about religion and evil, which we'll be covering next week, but today we'll just be looking at religion. So Harari says that many people feel that religion has been a source of disunion and disagreement, but just realize that in reality, it's been an immense unifier. And since all social orders and hierarchies are imagined, they are all fragile. They could just fall apart. And as we talked about in the last video, the larger society is, the more fragile that it is. And so what religion does, it gives, you know, a superhuman legitimacy to these fra super fragile structures and gives a sense of authority and creates some fundamental laws, puts everything together. Religion can thus be defined as a system of human norms and values that is founded on a belief in a superhuman order. And this involves two distinct criteria. Number one, like we said, there's a superhuman order, uh, which is not the product of humans. For example, UFC or football has rules that um, you can't knee someone in the head. And in UFC, it'd be like, if someone's on the canvas, you can't knee them in the head, okay? We made that rule. God didn't construct that rule. Number two, religion establishes rules and norms that are binding. Meaning, you know, many of us believe in ghosts and reincarnation for whatever reason, but they are not the source of our morals and behavioral standards. Harari says a religion must possess two further qualities on top of that. One, religion must be universal, he says, meaning it's true always and everywhere. And two, it must be missionary. 
As far as we know, these universal missionary religions only began to appear in the first millennium BC. Before this, they were local and exclusive. When animism was the central belief system, if you remember what animism is, if we look it up from Latin anima, breath, spirit, life, to breathe into is a religious belief that objects, places, and creatures all possess a distinct spiritual essence. So potentially animism perceives all things, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, weather systems, human handiwork, and perhaps even words, everything is animated and alive. Look down at your shoe, look at your elevator. My elevator, I, I, I swear to God, my elevator is alive and talks to me. So when animism, like I was saying, was a central belief system, the inhabitants of such and such a valley had to be aware of the local superhuman order and customs and thus to adapt their behavior accordingly. You don't want to go hang out down at the old elm tree with the noose on it and the crazy fucking swing set if that's where Freddy is. It's also interesting that the agricultural revolution was accompanied by a religious revolution. Up until this point, the hunter-gatherers may have seen wild plants and animals as equal in status to humans. The fact that man hunted deer did not make deer inferior to man. Didn't. Just like bears that hunted man did not make man inferior to the bears or tigers. This is because there was a communication, a negotiation, a magical communication between man and animals and other living beings. Whereas when the agricultural revolution came along, farmers owned their animals and plants and who has time to negotiate with that? <laughs> but just because the farmers own their land and their livestock, this did not ensure that the sheep would conceive or that the land would remain fertile. A leading theory about the origin of the gods is that they gained center stage because they offered a solution to this problem, like they were a medium. Remember, plants and animals lost their ability to speak, and so they needed a go-between. But what we're really talking about here is the advent and reign of polytheism. The rain god, the fertility goddess, the war god, Zeus, Hera, Jupiter. The list goes on in culture after culture. Notice how this new structure exalted the gods and humans because we could talk to one another. We talk to the gods, but we can't talk to the plants and animals. So again, they're a go-between. But you want to talk about downgrading, take a look at monotheism. Polytheism was pretty cool to the plants and animals in comparison. It was inherently open-minded and rarely persecuted heretics and infidels when it came to humans. And so you take a look at when these polytheists like the Romans, Egyptians, and Aztecs conquered huge empires, they did not try and convert their subjects. A citizen was expected to respect the empire's gods and rituals, but you can go ahead. You can keep your gods and rituals. You can you can keep what you have. Just respect us. You'll give us respect. However, with that said, the monotheistic god of the Christians refused to pay respect to the empire's protector gods and to the divinity of the emperor. There would be no respect. There would be no fucking compromise. The Romans reacted to this by killing a few thousand Christians, which by the way, was not really all that bad. But in contrast, the Christians slaughtered their fellow Christians by the millions to defend slightly different interpretations of their religion of love and compassion. That, that's what the Christians supposedly are. And yet they're, they go out in this complete murdering spree, murdering millions. Okay, these are the loving Christians. Look at the Catholics and Protestants. They engaged in religious wars between the 16th and 17th century over the nature of what they believed to be God's love. The Protestants believed that the divine love of God is so great that he was incarnated in flesh and allowed himself to be tortured and crucified, thereby redeeming the original sin and opening the gates of heaven to all those who profess faith in him. Catholics didn't agree. They maintained that faith, while essential, was not good enough. If you want to get in, you want to come in, guys? You have to participate in church rituals. Do good deeds. Show me, <laughs> show me what a good guy you are. Prove it. Protestants, though, they're like, you know, God doesn't need a deal, man. Okay, don't magnify your own importance, okay, by saying you have to do all these good deeds for God. He'll accept you regardless. Besides, he's not even really paying attention to you. And so because they couldn't agree, they killed each other by the hundreds of thousands. 
like in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where between 5,000 and 10,000 Protestants were slaughtered in less than 24 hours. Uh, that's a pretty good number. And that was good news to the Pope in Rome. That was music to his ears. He commissioned Giorgio Vasari to decorate one of the Vatican's rooms with a fresco of the massacre. Just to remind him how great, what a great day that was. I looked for this room when I was in Rome, and apparently it's off limits to visitors. Uh, yeah, I went down a couple different hallways there, calling out. Thank you so much for joining me today. Don't forget to hit that subscribe, although I'm sure you probably have already, and thumbs up button. And I hope that you guys have an awesome week because um, we're going to be picking it up here. We'll be doing more videos. I look forward to talking with you again shortly. It was great. As always. In Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, if you've not read it yet, Harari says that polytheism gave birth not only to monotheist religions, but also to dualist religions, which says there are two opposing forces in the universe, good and evil. The good side of the force and the dark side of the force. They're their own powers, and the entire universe is a battleground between these two forces. This is very attractive because it explains the question, why is there evil in the world? And why is there suffering? Why is it when I go down to the haunted house down the street, it actually feels like it's haunted because somebody was shot there so many years ago? Monotheists have to perform what Harari calls mental and intellectual gymnastics to explain how an all-knowing, all-powerful, and good God would allow this. One well-known explanation is that this is God's way of allowing for human free will. If there were no evil, humans could not choose between good and evil, and we need that choice in order to live up to our full potential. But this begs the question, if God knew in advance that this person would choose poorly and that they thus would have to be tortured in hell for eternity, in the cold flames of hell, why create them in the first place? Why are they here? What is that person good for? Monotheists have difficulty explaining evil. But for dualists, it's easy. Bad things happen because there's no single God. There's an evil power, loose and unhinged in the world. Did you see that movie? But dualists don't have it all wrapped up either. While they can explain evil, they can't easily explain the problem of order. Here's why. If the problem was created by a single God, it's clear why it is such an orderly place where everyone obeys the same laws, but if good and evil battle for control of the world, who enforces the laws governing this cosmic war? There would have to be a third party. Rory writes, are there agreed upon common laws that good and evil have negotiated over? Who decreed these laws to keep my atoms together, to keep the asteroids floating in space? So to reiterate, monotheism explains order, but is mystified by evil. Dualism explains evil, but is puzzled by order. And then Harari says something which none of us wanted to hear. There is one logical way of solving the riddle, to argue that there's a single omnipotent God who created the entire universe, and he's evil. I mean, it kind of makes sense. When you zoom in with a microscope, the entire world is a battleground. You ever look at a Venus flytrap eating a fly? Nobody in history has had the stomach for such a belief. Similarly, I have a hard time believing my body is supposedly evil. You ever just sit and stare and look at your hand? Why make such a distinction between body and spirit when they are both created by God? But it comes back to the monotheists wanting to explain evil and they can't do it no matter how hard they try so they combine jumbling everything together in a, under a single divine umbrella. So henceforth the average Christian believes in the monotheist God, the dualist devil, the polytheist saints, and in the animus ghosts. Freddy Krueger, uh, wh what's going on with that chair? Why did that door close all by itself? Harari says that scholars have a name for this simultaneous avowal of different and even contradictory ideas and rituals taken from different sources. It's called syncretism. Syncretism, which may be in fact the single great world religion.
Thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a privilege. Feel free to share this video with any of your friends. And don't forget to hit that subscribe, although I know you have already. If you, ha <laughs> if you haven't, uh, I just know you have. We're putting out three videos per week. I can't wait to see you shortly. So things are getting really exciting. It was great, as always.